introduction, Philip, and thanks SMA for having me along to speak. So yes, I'm going to talk about Colchester Museum's uh, current temporary exhibition. Um, it's first in a long time, and it's, it's an exhibition about jewellery in some ways, and in other ways it's not, really. It's about human stories, and I'm hoping what I talk about um, in the next 30 minutes is really going to resonate with the fantastic keynote we had last night with Gail. So only things she spoke about really sort of touched on some of the things I'm trying to get across in, um, in my talk today. So, so this is Sim's second catalytic exhibition as part of our uh, Arts Council England MPO programme. And this was written in this idea of a catalytic, catalytic exhibition and a catalytic object kicking it off. Um, so uh, Philip co-curated uh, Kiss and Tell, uh, which featured the, the kiss by Rodan at Ipswich, and that was very much a catalytic object. The idea behind these being not just spotlight um, objects, but something that really drives the exhibition and gets into the public's imagination. When we started thinking about the Sim, the Colchester catalytic exhibition, this wasn't quite on the table yet, but I was certainly inspired by this. So I say there was a catalytic object that spoke to me and set my, my brain racing, uh, as well as the team. Um, it's the first major exhibition since the castle redevelopment in 2014. Hands up, who's been to Colchester Castle Museum since the redevelopment? Oh, not very many people. You should go. Very reasonably priced. <laughs> um, it, has, it has really transformed the, the castle. And, um, you know, it's, it's a tricky one, the castle. It is a shell. It's a, it's a Norman keep, but it is a shell. There's nothing in there. You go go there really to see the castle because it is a museum and that's a tricky thing we always have to, to market and sell actually but you know it is the largest object in the collection in another sense. It's the first uh, exhibition since uh, Treasures of China in 2012 and I'm building up to this because uh, this was just going to be a fantastic opportunity but actually as things started to move forward a lot started to rest on this exhibition and we're a local authority uh, museum service and a lot of pressure started to be exerted so it, it changed its nature and certainly I felt this as a lead curator and part of the senior team delivering it uh, that pressure certainly started to feel uh, over the course um, <clears throat> it's got the title Adorn Jewelry the Human Story that wasn't the original title I'll come on to that in a bit as uh, Phillips intimated. Um, it was in the castle chapel, which is a pretty open space in the castle. Uh, we can have uh, weddings there, we have school sessions there, it's a versatile space. And we were going to close that off and, and use that as our temporary exhibition space. <clears throat> exhibition dates, so still going, going till Feb, you've got time to come down to Colchester if the trains allow. Importantly, it's, uh, the exhibition is free after normal admission to the castle so you are paying to get in but this is there's no additional cost to this and there's many program strands around this i'm not really going to touch on them i'm really talking about content today and getting at the heart of what stuff we've got in that exhibition and what we're trying to do with it i won't really talk about the commercial the learning we are collections and learning curators several years ago for a restructure uh, learning team and specialists uh, were abandoned and that was, that was merged with curatorial so in a good sense, we, we picked up the learning strand right from the beginning. So the, the learning element of the exhibition and engagement wasn't tacked on, as sometimes it can be if colleagues like that aren't involved early on. We included that from the start, but I'm not going to talk about that today. And there's a huge activities and events program that all had to tie into this and had to run for the, the length, the duration of the exhibition, six to seven months. <clears throat> a little bit about audience. Um, we did a little bit of research on this, so trying to key into who was visiting the castle. As I say, a lot is resting on this exhibition. Um, we've had to become far more commercially minded, huge targets being imposed by the local authority. I'm sure anyone else working in local authority museums understands these pressures now. And how, in engaging with this, you also try not to lose the scope of what you're doing as a museum service, maybe. So huge pressures there. And through that comes an understanding of who are our audience, or who do we want them to be? And how do we engage new people, I suppose? How do we get them coming to the castle? We know for a fact that loads of people in Colchester love the castle, never been in it, but they love their heritage. <laughs> but I've never been in it. You know, so, and that is a problem because you know, they're, they're not, not paying up and we're not really engaging with them. It's, it's great they think it's important, but it's not for them. And it should be, it is theirs. So we've got <clears throat> 
an existing core audience we're going to expand on, and then to um, um, sort of experimental audiences we wanted to grow through this, um, quite, quite low attendance at the moment. Um, and in general, that's sort of a, a local and a family audience are really key, which is interesting because I would say jewellery is not a very accessible topic to little people. And so again, being collections and learning curators, knowing that from the start, building audience in from the start and knowing it was about family, connecting kids, adults with this exhibition, we, we could play with that and try to make this subject accessible to them. <clears throat> we also had recently, it's, um, it's interesting, it was a political motivation to introduce a residence pass that everyone groaned about because it was a huge piece of work. And I actually think it has really played into our favour that if you're in within a certain postcode area, Colchester essentially, you can apply, you can pay once for a year's entry to the castle. And the exhibition is clearly something we could push with that. And that has, that has worked out very well for us, actually. So maybe we'll have to take back all the groaning against the local politicians who, who uh, crowbarred this, this, this through. I think it's turned out to be a good thing. So a few key messages. What was this exhibition all about? What were you trying to achieve? I wanted to showcase, showcase some glitz and glamour, really. You've got fantastic collections. Um, now, now three, almost three years ago, when we sat down, we, when we were discussing as a very large curatorial group and people beyond the curatorial teams, what do we do? Jewellery sort of came naturally. We thought this is, this is an easy one because what we thought people liked and certainly the strength of our collections. Lots of sh lovely shiny things in there. And we wanted to, uh, to expand, you know, go from Bronze Age right up to modern day, although that was an issue, uh, bearing in mind the collections again. And really it's getting underneath these objects and exploring the human element. So it's what, what people chose to wear. Why were they wearing that? What was that saying about them? Really we're getting at identity here and how this has and hasn't changed over, over centuries, over, over millennia. And I, I focus on these key messages um, because the title did change and in some ways that didn't affect us and it did in others. But those key messages never did change. I'll come on to that. So a bit of overview on content, over 300 objects spanning a huge range of time, um, 310 to be precise, um, includes a lovely, got a chance to get hoard into the exhibition. We have, no, I don't believe we have a hoard, a total hoard on display in Colchester Museums, any of our venues. So it was a great opportunity to try and get a hoard on display, 52 individual items. Um, huge amount coming out of store. This is one of what I wanted to try and achieve. I wanted stored collections to come out for this. Um, there's lots of lovely stuff on display in our museums, but it wasn't about rehashing that unless we really needed to. Um, so those 25 objects that did move from a permanent display had to for a reason. It wasn't just to try and fill a bit more space. I was constantly being told, oh, it's very small jewellery, isn't it? It's so small. And I said, yeah, that's why we need lots of it. And we need to display it well. But don't worry, I think the public understand jewellery is small because they wear jewellery. They understand that. It's OK. But we do need lots of it. So that's a caveat if you're ever going to do a jewellery exhibition. Blimey, do you need a lot of stuff to make an impact. Um, so those 25 objects moving around, if you like, into a temporary exhibition space had to earn their, their mark there. Um, and I have to say, well, Philip can advise me on this because he deals with loans a lot across the service. 30% um, total loans coming in. I think that's a really high percentage. Um, but this was really important because we had this Essex remit. I didn't want this just to be about Colchester and Colchester collections. I wanted to, that broader geographical remit of Essex. So we had to look to our, our partners out there who hold amazing collections and amazing stories. Um, and this was really vital for us. And of course, some other big, big key lenders, notably the British Museum, which I'll come to on a, in a little bit. Um, yeah, the BM, this is interesting because, of course, they've got lovely Colchester stuff, have the BM, and we wanted it back for a little bit of time. And this is really connected with, with people. When I've spoken about this and put this across, Colchester residents really resonate with this. These are our objects coming back. Are you going to keep them? No, unfortunately, they have to go back to the British Museum. But this really connects with them. And this, you know, I moved from the Museum of London, huge museum, almost a semi-national. And we've working in a local authority have really understood now the sense of place. Even though we engage with that, London's a big old beast when we work with London archaeology. But here in Colchester, I suddenly saw this real, real connection. Um, some of these objects have not been back since they were excavated. So this is a real, real coup for us. It's, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, so we've got 46 loans, not just from museums and institutions, from private individuals. I'll talk about this in a little bit. 
Um, 40% are really shiny. This was important. I really said the, the exhibition, the key message was about celebrating glitz and glamour, especially under its working title. Um, and that was really important, really to showcase and set these, these, these objects alive. Um, and we've got a lot of rings. So the key to that <laughs> is to obviously do a display on rings, but also drip them throughout the exhibition and try and find meaning behind, you know, it could just be, you know, oh, another, another 10 gold rings, brilliant. But finding those individual stories behind them in each section of the exhibition, how does this object mean something different when it's just a ring at the end of the day, isn't it? <clears throat> so, oldest object in the collection, wooden water, gold torque cord, very interesting. These, these three of these lovely pieces, all chopped up. Um, had a fantastic loan in from, from Norwich, Norwich Museums, Norwich Castle, because ours were all chopped up and they looked like bracelets, but of course there would have been one, one talk. Um, and Norfolk just acquired this amazing, complete example. And I don't think, it's amazing. If someone came to me and went, oh, that thing you've just acquired, can we put that in our exhibition? I'd just say, you're having a laugh, aren't you? No way. And um, they did. And I think it's because I pushed so hard on something else, the lovely Dr. Tim Pestel felt so sorry for me. He said, yeah, go on. So, um, it was a, and that was a fantastic loan that just made sense of what could be quite confusing to some people without using loads of words to explain what's gone on here, why is it being chopped up, all of that sort of thing. It's just a really neat display. Go, here's a complete talk. Yes, it's from Norfolk. That doesn't really matter in this sense because we're making something of the, 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 these Essex pieces here. Um, <clears throat> had uh, our, our lovely friends, friends of Colchester Museums, always supporting us. And um, this, this ring, St. Barbara, came up around Chelmsford, but they didn't want it because they've got loads of iconographic rings, but we didn't. So sometimes we do extend our, our collecting area. We do have a, a Essex remit now and again. So David didn't want it when we said yes, and the friend stepped in. Um, really important. It's a female saint as well. It just it had a place in this exhibition. And smallest object in the exhibition is, I suppose, a single grain of gold dust. And what's great about being very broad curators now, we are not specialists in name, but we have them within this broad team, all collections and learning curators, is that we have to engage with the entire collection. So I'm a, I'm a Romanist in many ways, but my remit now is very, very broad, as is everyone else. And that does mean we constantly seek to see how can we bring in our collections. And we've got a lot of a lot of specimens, a lot of natural science specimens into this exhibition. I think they were really, really impactful, at least on a very visual level. So that's a real, I think a real bonus working outside of maybe uh, prescriptive uh, collecting area or a collections work with. So let's get the elephant out of the, the, the room. The, the problem with this. So the title of this exhibition was going to be Essex Bling. Um, this was the working title. I didn't come up with the title, but I really liked the title. I thought this was really playful. Um, I think our key message, well, we worked up the key message with this in mind. Um, um, but it, it became a bit of a problem because I started to, I didn't really do any audience testing, which we should have done a lot more of, looking back in hindsight, a good thing. Uh, I start, and we started to experience the curatorial echo chamber. So I went to the British Museum, Essex Bling, here's our brief, what do you think? We love it, that's great. All of these museums, all of these creators, all these people who work with objects, people, stories, they love this. Um, and the Essex Bling, the title was signed off uh, by senior management three times. So if it's, not, if it's been signed off once, that's it, isn't it? So there's obviously a problem here. And it took me, and I have to say, I wasn't driving this, but I had to use this to sell to people. We had to apply to the BM for obviously loans, etc. So it, it needed something. And we needed to start generating a narrative around this exhibition, all trickling down from this title. Um, so it took me going on shared parental leave and for me to come back to go, yeah, we've changed the title, Blin. Except we don't know what we've changed it to. It just can't be Essex Bling. Because what started to come out was that a lot of Essex residents didn't see the, the fun side of this. Actually, they found it quite a derogatory term. So they're not all, the people of Essex are not all fans of TOWIE. They're not all fans of uh, <laughs> uh, Bling in this sense. And also interesting was we were also trying to engage with makers and some makers were saying well I don't think I want to put my my objects my work into a show because you're trivializing it and it just shows you the perceptions um Gail last night talked about assumptions and perceptions and I had an assumption here and it was wrong I have to say some people did like it they did like the name but overall we did a bit of test 
uh, test, test running of the title, went to, uh, up to University of Essex, where we were doing some events, started talking to the guys there, what do you think, Essex bling? Well, of course, that was hilarious to them. What an antiquated term, you know? Isn't that old? I was like, come on, it's 90s, that was yesterday. No, like, if you're gonna call it anything, you call it ice, it's Essex ice, isn't it? I was like, oh, I, I don't know, because I'm out of touch. <laughs> So it just really, really showed that I think a big learning, learning someone to take away from this for me was do, do not assume, do that audience testing, something that's been built into our next, um, uh, the project management of the, of the next catalytic we're going to do. Um, but what's important, those key messages didn't change and they weren't affected, however it did affect um, trying to get this exhibition together to a degree, certainly design, etc. Um, but actually it worked in our favour. Um, I came back, we sat in a room for six hours until we, we got the title out. And it's always hard if someone locks you in a room and says, be creative and don't come out till you've done it. Um, someone did, did leave halfway through. <laughs> I uh, won't mention their name or what they did, but they'd had enough. But, you know, we had to stick it out. And at one point, I think someone just turned to me and said, what is this exhibition, Glyn? And I said, well, it's jewellery. I said, but it's not about jewellery. It's why we wear jewellery. And really beyond that, it's about the stories behind this jewellery. So there you go. It's Adorn, jewellery, the human story. Um, but don't get me wrong, Adorn, it's a funny old word. I've seen it and said it so many times. It's a non-thing now. When you see it on our marketing, it's become a logo almost. So... You know, that word I don't think is unproblematic. Someone said, can we call it adornment? I said, no, you can't do that. You know, I don't find it an accessible word. And really, it's the tagline, I think, that really sells this exhibition. And of course, that exhibition does have to be that, you know. And I think what it is now, it, it is an Essex bling. If you walked in there, I think you, you would go, oh, I don't, I don't quite get this. But I do think the human story, story works. So that's a little bit on the name. Uh, our display space, display space, as I've mentioned, was the chapel. And as soon as I knew it was going to be in here, I thought this space really lends itself to a thematic approach. Um, these alcove chapels that you can walk into, you know, really lend themselves to being a thing. Um, but as an archaeologist, I wanted to get a good bit of chronology in there. As soon as I mentioned this to my curatorial team, they were like, oh, boring. And I said, well, audiences need that, and they need a bit of grounding. And again, when I was on leave and appointed uh, someone in my place, what they did was they, they took that idea of having a, a chronological spine to the exhibition. I said, we need to ground it somehow if we're doing these big different themes. But they applied to a theme to that as well. So, around the outside of the, the chapel, in these alcoves, these are our big themes. And the idea originally was you, you walk in, turn left, zoom round and come out, and explain why that didn't work with your stories at the end. You kick off with materials and making, um, you know, it'd be crazy not to explore this side of jewellery, the people behind the making of it. I think sometimes we can focus too much on the, on the end product, the wearer. So this was fantastic, a really big alcove to explore. This was several subsections. Hoop and bezel, all about deconstructing the ring, an object that hasn't really changed its, its form over millennia. Fashions of the empire really started to look at jewellery, uh, on the big scale, and we have all, all along, the you know, Colchester Museums has a fantastic designated archaeology collection, which is really formed up of the Roman collections. And uh, through this process, I kept having to kind of get away from the Roman. It wasn't a Roman exhibition, and I also didn't want it to just be an archaeology exhibition. I know, don't, don't, don't throw anything at me. I wanted it to be more than that. Um, but Fashions of the Empire, you know, really celebrated what we do have in the collection. I'll come on to that in a minute, a bit more about that. Um, so the really important sections for me were Made in Essex, where we approached modern makers to get them in, because it's very hard to explore ancient makers. I found the evidence for that, how we, we narrate that. It's quite tricky, so we needed that. Um, also to bring the collections up to date, because our collections are not, not great, and what I call, you know, modern, post-medieval. We haven't really got any modern jewellery as such. So bringing these guys in would bring us right up to the 21st century, so a great time span. And then finally, your stories, all about bringing the people of Colchester into the exhibition uh, and really exploring, getting underneath the human story there. Why do you wear what you wear? What does it mean to you? And sharing those very personal stories and hopefully that then reflecting back on this archaeological material for the most part, where we do our best as curators to weave a story and elicit stories. But ultimately, you know, we don't, we don't know the answers to all those questions. So down the, down the centre... The theme was gold, and they cleverly took 
Glynn's case of jet that I really wanted in the exhibition. Um, jet is known as black gold in, in Europe in many places. So prehistoric gold, black gold, golden garnet, religious gold, took us through, through the centuries, through the millennia. But again, on another theme, the theme of gold. Design concepts, these are quite early ones because you'll see bling popping up. Um, <clears throat> Responding to the exhibition space, we're really lucky at Colchester Museums, or sorry, at Sims, we have a design team, although they're incredibly overworked because, like Philip, they work at both sites, Ipswich Museums and Colchester Museums. So, um, but but they're, they're fantastic. So we have in-house design, even if we don't have in-house techs. Um, the name changed during this process. Uh, and it's just working with a, a funny space in a way, which is good in some ways. It's unique, this space, but it also causes problems. We hadn't had an exhibition in there since the castle redevelopment and they'd redone the floor. So at one point someone did say, well, what's the, what's the load bearing on the floor? Does anyone know? You know, we've not actually tested an exhibition in this space, even though exhibitions had, had happened in there before. So limitations and ad advantages to this and others like Mark this morning have, have touched on that when you do gallery redesigns. Um, so this, the inspiration for the marketing of this exhibition, what you saw on my, on my title slide, really came from an Egyptian mummy portrait. And, and we thought, gosh, you know what, we're, not, we're gonna, not gonna get the permissions to be able to doctor this. All we wanted to do was change it a little bit, but that was, I just knew that was never going to happen. So our, our senior designer, Jane, actually commissioned an artist to try and, try and replicate that. And although that's a certain thing, it, did be, it has become unique. And then they started working with a lot of other ideas, like a reclining Claudius here. We said, well, we'll try and take it away from the Roman. Roman's good, it is a big selling point of this, but it's not all about that. So this has eventually got worked up into who we call Roman lady, modern man, and, and rough lady, poor, poor rough lady. And see, we got, we got rid of rough lady. We don't use rough lady, because she looks too much like Elizabeth. And that wasn't working, and it, it kind of started showing a chronology we didn't want. We wanted, let's stick with Roman lady and come right up to date with modern man. And you'll see it's the artist again we commissioned, took these ideas on board, and you'll see all little things, so like Camilla Dune and going up the arm, lots of objects here represented as his tattoos, and tattoos did come into the exhibition uh, 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 later on. And here we go, here's the final design concept. The idea of uh, lovely, lovely lady here, a Roman lady's earring floating around the gallery, lots of gold, very dark. This is a complete white box, and we had to shut out all the light to try and bring that, that light down and create a really atmospheric space. And I am hoping, coming towards Christmas, people do say it, it feels quite special in this space, and I'm hoping the Christmas spirit will kick in and it, people really, really engage with this. Um, and what you can't see over here is the end, the huge alcove coming round, which has your stories in it and a huge light box. So I mentioned that you should go around this way, but what happened is people walked here and just blown away by this light box and all the little kids just gravitated towards it, which is fantastic in a way, but um, an issue if you've designed the exhibition to, to be appreciated in a certain way, not that it, not that it really matters. So here you go, this is what it looks like in the flesh. I've only got a few photos. I was trying to find photos at the exhibition. I can't believe I don't have that many of it. So you have to bear with me with these. So that's title, title uh, uh, of the exhibition going in there. Huge piece of vinyl. We've got the central spine here um, of, of gold thematic cases. Lots of big drops in the alcoves. Close up of the fashions of the Empire case with some of our lovely loans from the British Museum. And on the right there are the big vinyls that jump around and, and the text as well on, on the wall in vinyl. It's all quite big and imposing. Um, just the detail on a couple of the cases, hoop and bezel here. And this is one of the shelves in the materials and making case. Um, and uh, people are a bit funny about it. this is one of my favorite cases uh, in another case i wanted 10 crucibles and the rest of my team said why well, have 10 when you can have one it's like well <laughs> why have one paleolithic hand axe when you can have 101 eh duncan uh, so we settled on three <laughs> and i suppose that all the time is the archaeologist in me going but they're great they're all different and i like they're manky bits of pot glen we don't like them so and i think that's really good being challenged like that by non-specialists, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And I really like this shelf. You've got a, you've got a late Iron Age Roman tool hoard here on loan from uh, Wolfham, Wolfham Abbey, Epping Forest Museum. Obviously bringing in modern, modern tools as well, trying to play off all the time with that. Um, 
So I'm going to focus on recontextualizing the Fennec treasure because I'm getting to the point of my inspiration where I kick-started with thinking about stories. I'm going to slam this up. Sorry, it's a big chunk of text. This was part of the loan request to the British Museum, okay? And what I was focusing on here is the fact that the Fennec hoard, so post-conquest, pre boudican amazing hoard of jewellery, gold jewellery from Colchester, um, is displayed in the castle aesthetically but what you lose is the fact that this is a combination of two people's collections of jewellery Mr and Mrs Fennig they're called that because it's found on a Fennig's department store that's why it's called the Fennig Hoard but we've got male and female jewellery here and of course it's incredibly difficult to sex small finds but you do have so earrings I don't know of any case of earrings been associated with Roman men in the ancient world so they are they are female other things such as bracelets could be any, but there are also armalay in this collection. So armalay and military awards, um, sort of bangles, if you like. Um, and so it's a collection of all these. So we know there is a man here and we know there is a woman present here. Uh, and I feel that human story is a bit lost. And also I came to Colchester and this had all been done. I thought, oh, what a shame. So I wanted to try and recontextualize it. And I focused on you know other big events out there you know yesterday Gail was sort of saying no oh, we always hear about Pompeii but this is one one example where you go it's just like, like Pompeii in a way this jewelry is the spitting image of the stuff out there it's almost exactly the same time and a catastrophic event has saved it for us has preserved it for us albeit in different parts of the empire in very different circumstances you know there are similarities here and we've still not led with a Pompeii press release and I feel that's a real shame when there are direct connections and this is what I sold it to to the BM um, so major loan of jewellery from from the BM to contextualize this and for me my catalytic object really was this pair of gold ball earrings um, there's only three from all of Rome and Britain, and all three are from Colchester. So there's a single one that is out there somewhere, pre, pre uh, Treasure Act, so it's with a private individual, and these pair from the Fennec Hoard. And you find these all the way to Fayum. You see them on the Fayum portraits. We, they've been found on, on people, uh, buried people from um, Pompeii, Herculaneum, etc. So this is a fashion trend, and hence the, the title of the sub theme here. Um, they're all over the place and I'm reliably informed by uh, Philip Wise that if you get into the museum's journal which I have you are now famous <laughs> and this is what I, I chose when they approached me and said can we do an interview what's the one object best in show so for me this is where it kicked off and I thought you know we've got an object here that can really tie in a huge story to place something in a much broader empire the Roman empire in one section of this exhibition and got me thinking about the human story how do we redisplay this and get towards that not just present it as lovely shiny jewelry which of course it is so that's one of the thematic sections. I'm going to go over a few others. Materials and making, you know, we could explore everything here. It also gave us the opportunity just to get a lot of stuff into cases. So if you go precious metal, it means rather than pursuing that chronological approach, we had everything here. I suppose a, a key loan from Saffron Walden Museum was a gold, a huge gold Viking ring. But rather than put that in the ring section, it's like, let's just slap it in materials and making under gold with all these other gold objects from all different periods of time and there's something about that it's about someone of just getting your, your collections in somehow uh, unashamedly here um, we also explored tools techniques production that's all the crucibles came in and evidence that ancient makers and that's that's very very tricky actually um, I don't have a it might have popped up earlier a little plaque an object that did move in the castle from the display uh, in the permanent galleries on Roman religion, um, where it's there as a little plaque because it's a dedication to Sylvanus. But if reading into this, also realise it's actually uh, uh, Sintusmus, the Roman name, he's, his name is on the plaque. He's also only one of two named coppersmiths in the, in the entirety of Roman Britain. So out, out it came from religion as a, as a, as a vow, a dedicated vow, into a dawn and into evidence for ancient makers because he's a named maker, which sounds old but is incredibly rare. Hoop and bezel, it's probably quite obvious what this is all about, the fingering, the three sub things, love, marriage and friendship, of course me memento mori rings here are fantastic, named individuals, um, very rare I think to have a pair of wedding bands in the collection, I don't know, I don't know if that is rare, it's rare for us, um, of two individuals. Um, so mem uh, memorial memento mori was its own section and myth and magic which was how do you get the Romans into this section too I suppose. Um, 
power. So here we went really big. This is a really big idea of only four objects in this section. Um, and we really wanted to look at how personal dawn, well, how it denotes and connotes ideas of power. Had an Iron Age talk. This is what the, we've got the real, one of the real Ipswich talks uh, from the British Museum. So originally excavated in, in Ipswich, but in the BM's collection, one of them. Fantastic to have a talk in the exhibition. A late Roman priestly crown, I'll come on to. Uh, 16th century sergeant at Law's ring, and another a Roman engraved imperial ring. Um, this is um, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, who were the first emperors to co-share power. They're the first joint rulers. No one, I came back off uh, shared parental leave and everyone went, we've got this one object, and we don't know where to put it in the exhibition. I said, oh, stick it into power. It's shared power. It's not priestly power, not divine power, awarded power, but it goes into that, that section. And I should say, both of these two rings are from Colchester. Um, so again, important we're getting Colchester objects in. They're, they're loans from the British Museum. I want to touch on the priestly crown because I was blown away when I realised these were in Sims collections. And I should say they're in Ipswich Museum's collections, excavated by Nina Layard, um, very interesting early female archaeologist, um, interesting in her own right, uh, written these up. And I, I was just gobsmacked when I found these in the collection. They're not on permanent display, have been on display before. And I turned to my team and I was just like, this blows my mind. Roman crowns, these are so rare. And they're like, it's really nice, Glenn. It's really nice that you're excited by this. <laughs> and I will use the word they said. They said, but we think it looks a bit shit. <laughs> um, and I don't know, you must be salivating here, Anthony. What an amazing object, Roman crown. And I couldn't believe it. Three and a half years I've been cramming the Romans down their throats, and this is how I'm repaid. Um, and again, this brought me back to, um, uh, you know, assuming and assumed knowledge. You know, they couldn't see what I was seeing, and I wasn't seeing a fine thing, just, you know, from what I know. It's just like, what an amazing object. And they're like, you need to convey that somehow. And they said, well, why don't we, why don't we try and make a replica? And so we approached George Easton of uh, Dane Geld uh, Historic Jewelry. I don't know if you know him and um, said, could you do this? And he could, yeah, he said, yeah, I could do it for lots of money. And I said, oh, I, ha I have this amount of money. It's not thousands. And he said, well, one thing you'll have to do is I normally do all of the research myself, uh, but you'll just have to submit the final design. And you're gonna have to do that in a week because I'm working on multiple projects. There's lots of TV projects too. And we worked it out. We went, he'll, he'll get there just in time for the install when it goes into the case of other BMX uh, exhibition objects, you know, other loans. So we had to, plan it for when the BM Courier was there, and it did come just in time. But we had to do all that, that research ourselves um, in about a week. And uh, Toynbee's is still a fantastic bit of work on Roman votive plaques. Um, and really, we've interpreted, as I believe, this is um, a, late, it's a late Roman um, object. The hoard is late Roman, and it relates to, and I've used inverted commas because I know it's not a preferred term, but the pagan revival. I don't know, do I lose points for that, Anthony? No, people don't like that term, but essentially it's, it's late Roman. This is what I uh, used as inspiration, these votive uh, leaves to try and see what the roundels might look like. Obviously, if we go back, you've got all these little, little temples here. What would go in here? What are the three staples? They're amazing. He'd, he'd think I'd get excited by a Roman staple, but that's what they are. Absolutely fantastic object. And then what's the, what's the feather doing? So I did a bit of research and very quickly <laughs> knocked this together and sent it to George. And then I kept emailing him and I kept calling him and I kept emailing him and I kept calling him and he wouldn't reply and he wouldn't reply. And then he did reply and I said, how's it going? Have you gone over the budget? And he went, I blew the budget about a month ago. And I went, right, well, because right, you, you did mention thousands of pounds, which I don't have. And he said, and I shouldn't really say this to this room, but he said, well, I just thought you museums need it, don't you? So just write it off. We'll go with your original, your original quote. And he probably put you know, literally thousands of pounds worth of his time into this. He could sell his replica for thousands of pounds. Incredibly generous of him. Um, I'll forewarn him that you're going to get in touch. <laughs> and that's the finished result. And to suddenly realise why we needed to create a replica, because not even I was seeing this in my head. And I have to say, this was well worth the investment because people are really responding to this object in the exhibition because it sits next to the original. And it's a good bit of experimental archaeology because um, I said, no, let's put the feathers where the, uh, where the staples are, but don't put it on the, uh, don't put it on the central one because it'll cover the carnelian. I chose a, car a carnelian, that was a, a good guess, best as anything else, but that would cover it up. And now I'm thinking, actually, I don't think these feathers 
were on the crown at all. I think something else went on. You know, priestly regalia can include all sorts. Have I got five minutes? No, I better rush. Am I? All right. I'm going to rush through. <laughs> Maybe we can chat about this later if you're interested. So a bit of experimental archaeology has been really well received. Right, I really like JET. I made a case all about JET. That meant we could, uh, we could get a load of new research in. We don't have research built into our curatorial remits. We don't do research as collecting and learning curators because we're doing everything else. A real opportunity, a pleasure, privilege for me to do this. And we're publishing this little chap who turned up during a huge move that happened just pre, um, just the start of this whole exhibition planning. Um, what's really interesting is there are several of these pendants. There's probably less than 50 from the Roman Western Empire. The one in the middle, they're all from Colchester, all on loan, all in the exhibition. Uh, the one in the middle is really interesting. It always gets overlooked. Jet is associated with women through the archaeological record and the written sources. There's always exceptions. And this is always glossed over. It's like, oh, two cupids making a pot. Those cupids are always doing something, aren't they? But what's interesting is that Colchester is a major potter, has a major pottery, pottery industry in the Roman period, massive. So what does that mean? You know, and it's always glossed over that this potentially is a piece of female jewellery that depicts um, manufacture here. And I'm just really, really interested in going, well, what does that mean? If this was a woman who owned this, what's her relationship to that? Was she a potter? I never feel like women are seen as makers in that sense in the ancient world. You don't see that discussed as like, it's assumed like it's a men a lot of the time, I believe. I find that really interesting. Or maybe she just owned a pot pottery industry. Nothing's ever been explored about this object, what it depicts, who it was found with, etc. And the fact that jet is often associated with women in the Roman world. And I want to come back to that right in the end as I zoom for all the rest. So, made in Essex, really, really important um, section for me. I really wanted this to happen. Um, about bringing our collections up to date and the idea of the exhibition up to date. All you had to have was a strong connection or inspiration with Essex. Um, lovely Holly here um, submitted, uh, her, she went on her holidays to Switzerland and she makes badges and said, oh, can I, can I put these in? And we said no, but we looked at her website and suddenly realized she had the entire Essex collection of badges. I mean, why didn't you submit the Essex badges? You know, I didn't think about it. So sometimes you really do have to do the work for people out there. Uh, and we got her into the exhibition. There they all are, really interesting. They are all uh, women, female makers. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a case of just get a bloke in, to get a bloke in there. You had to have that strong connection with Essex, and I wasn't going to move on that. Uh, so interesting that we see a lot of ancient male makers, but we've got all female makers. So I didn't make of that anything in the exhibition. I just think it's an interesting observation. All completely different in what they do, their design styles. So Holly creates these badges, and they're based on OS maps. So this is Colchester Castle with whatever A road and that, and they're fantastic. All of these makers to really clash with each other, to really show the difference of modern making. And of course, this is to reflect back on the, on the rest of the exhibition. We didn't juxtapose anything. We thought that was a bit too clunky, so it's in its own section. I'm rushing through now. Um, uh, and again, the audiences, people really like this in the exhibition. I mean, all that other stuff, all that old stuff's okay. But they love this, and I think it really fits in well. And without being over the top, it, it really makes sense the exhibition. And lastly, your stories. So this was our community engagement bit, where we wanted Colchester people represented. Um, and they loaned, in most cases, their objects to the exhibition. We wanted to bring it up to date. So tattoos came into it as well, because we just excluded ancient tattoos or any way of referencing or getting into that. But we were, you know, it's a really modern way of decorating and identifying, etc. This is the second canvas that's going up, and this is designed internally. So this is the first one. I'm going to shove it all up. You can read it, talk to me about it later. That's the first one. Huge light box that everyone's drawn to, and we're changing it twice over to try and get as many stories in there as, as possible. Last slide, I promise, Philip, sorry. On the left, so this can be the ridiculous, you know, send us your story. If you like blue jewellery, because you like the colour blue, we want to hear about it. If you have a very, very personal item of jewellery that is like a modern memento mori, let, tell us about it. So Jim on the far left there, can you see all of his uh, vegetable, can you see his vegetable family? That's his entire family in vegetable cartoon form. 
Um, just amazing. And him at different stages of his life. So there's some, you know, I do watch a lot of tattoo fixers and I was worried we we're going to get loads of flowers and flaming skulls. But actually, we did get all of that. We've had some really, really personal, interesting tattoos come in. Um, Alice, as I've met her and know, known her, also known as Darren, um, uh, identifies as uh, being gender fluid. And they describe being in boy mode or girl mode. But some days, if Alice wakes up and Alice is in boy mode, but wants to connect to her feminine side, she'll put this, this flower um, in her hair, this, this, this piece of joy, this, head, this headband. And it's a way of her not dressing up as Alice, but it's a nod to that, that side of her identity. And again, if we didn't know this and you just had that object, you'd have no concept of the story behind it. And very lastly, Shan, Shan has a necklace that says, I think, number one mum on it, it was a bit better. There we go, number one mum. Again, if we found that archaeologically, we would assume that that, was, that had been given to her maybe by um, a child of hers, son, a daughter. Um, it's actually, she gave that to her mother. She waxed lyrical about her mother when we interviewed her. Her mother was, you know, incredibly important to her, uh, incredibly important in her community. And this is the only thing she has left of her mum. So she gave that to her mum and took it back when she died. And again, without this explanation, I think you would lose that entire human story. So thinking back to that jet pendant, what are all these questions we don't have the answer to, to pick up on, on something Gail was talking about in her keynote? Apologies for overrunning. You must come down and see it.